I'm Mel Stewart, and this is the Swim Swam Podcast. Joining me is Coleman Hodges, Swim Swam Center Production, and the man on deck, your guy for all of the swim meet action. And joining us today is, is a fan favorite, someone who has a unique piece of swimming history and is one of my favorite swimmers purely because of geography, two-time Olympic gold medalist, Ricky Barons. Thank you for having me. So I just want to go, I just want to be on the record with you and say that from the community of old Georgetown, oldie Georgetown in yeah. Charlotte, North Carolina, I'm the greatest swimmer that's ever been. I'm starting a hall of fame and I'm going to make myself the chair of the board and, uh, and I might let you, I might let you be on the board. I'm, I'm, we're going to talk to the board members and it's going to take it under consideration. I, I, I don't that? know if you're. I don't know if your name is on the board anymore there. Or if- <laughs> <laughs> okay, fine. Let's just let's just let's just get into it. We're gonna get into it. There's I got a I got a bone to pick with you. Uh, so Ricky, um, <laughs> Ricky and I grew up in the same neighborhood. And um, if you're if you're very shallow, and you're uh, and you're 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 like gold medal Mel, and you care about all the records, and then you stay, it keeps you up at night, and you're worried about those records in summer league swimming. <laughs> um, then this is what you should know it's bad mojo when another olympic star grows up in the same neighborhood and comes in and just sweeps up any mention of you on the record board do i have any records left Are, is there a record left do you know honestly i have i haven't been there in, in so long and and you know what At, and after me came michael chadwick and so they're We've actually, that little oldie, and we say oldie Georgetown because it's O-L-D-E, which took me forever to remember. Uh, we've produced basically three world championship team members from there. And uh, it's, which is, yeah, my mom, my, my mom was swim coach since before I was born. And uh, she always brings that up. So it, it, there's always been a, a lot of little swim stars that, that grew up there. That's, that's where swimming begins. That's when swimming is like fun. That's like childhood for me. Is, is that summer league swim team spending every single day at the pool, staying up late, going to the swim meets. That's, those are the best times in life right there. It's uh, so I, you know, I, 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 I feel I'm embarrassed. I forgot this. I, that's right. Chadwick grew up there. So um, are your parents still there? Do they move out? Is, uh, are his parents still there? Are they still, are they still, who's living in the neighborhood now? Oh, they're not in the neighborhood anymore. No. Um, my mom, she just stopped coaching last year or the year before. Um, so she just retired. And, um, but yeah, my, my mom's her claim to fame, uh, of course, outside of me is <laughs> she taught the, uh, Michael Chadwick how to swim to the point of like, he, he had not been in the water. She started teaching him to swim from start till getting him into, into the year round program. So she, um, it's she she's uh she's one of the best co- age group coaches i think in the u.s and and but she also co did she she coached the south mac didn't she for years and yep. years and years How, i mean like was it 30 years no 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 she she didn't coach while i was there she coached i think my little brother um after i was there so 2006 um and then she just retired this year so my yeah family knew my, my dad retired this year um in january 1st and they went and got a, a their their winter house down in Florida, and then uh, the, the the COVID pandemic hit. So my dad swims every single day, but they're living the dream. They got a twenty yard pool in the backyard on a golf course that has thirty six holes. So when everything got shut down, he couldn't go to the pools and swim. So he just swam in the backyard, and then they go skip out to the golf course, and they go over to the beach and here and there, and they're they're doing okay down there. <laughs> yeah, it's a nice lifestyle. <laughs> Yeah. Wow, Coleman, are you are so? Are you impressed with old Georgetown? Old Georgetown's kind of impressive, right? If you're listening, if you're out there and you're listening and you're feeling insecure about your summer league swim team, that's good. We want you to feel that way. They have over 200 kids, I think, coming oh in God. there. 200 kids on a summer league team. <laughs> so many. Yeah. Well, I mean, that, the pool's just a cement hole. It's uh, 
but I mean, I did, did so, you know, I'm, I'm older than you. I, 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 you know, it's, it's, it, we, I lived, I'm, it, there were epic moments at that pool. Did you do a lot? Did you play a lot of sharks and minnows? Yeah. Sharks and minnows. And yes, sharks and minnows over there in the deep end. We'd, uh, yeah, I mean, we, we were, when I was in high school and being a lifeguard, I felt bad because of what I did in childhood, because we were, we were the kids there on a rainy day swimming in the pool and the lifeguards were sitting up in the lifeguard stand, just look, giving it, giving us these dirty looks. <laughs> I mean, we were, we were there every single day and uh, they probably still have the same old vending machines and uh, right underneath the, the gazebo and you know, sharks and minnows all day long. Yeah, it's it's cool. All right, I'm I'm gonna move I'm gonna move off of this. We're gonna move we're gonna move away from the summer league swim team. We just we want to drop that piece of history that's so very important to the sport of swimming. The uh, please tell your mom and dad hello. If I, I don't want to forget that before we take off. So did you did you take a shower this morning, or is this like you just rolled out of bed and 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 juiced your hair? This hair, I had my sister in law cut it a month and a half ago. And now it's getting to the point again where I need to find somewhere to cut it. It's, you know, it, it was 105 here in Austin, Texas the other day. 105, feeling like 115, and it's getting a little too hot for, for a big head of hair. But it, you know, the, the new lifestyle we're in now, it's, it is you roll out of bed, might take a shower, but you're just doing Zoom calls, shifting it from room to room every single day. And um, it's funny, I, I do say Zoom calls, but I, I tell people I relate Zoom now to Speedo. Because, you know, it's a Zoom call, but you could be on Microsoft Teams, WebEx, go to meeting or Zoom. And it's like Speedo, they've done it, but. <laughs> oh, that's good. That's not, and I, I like that. It's, it's a, um, it's what we're going to get, we're going to get into your swimming career. And, 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 and uh, if, for anybody who's super young and, and, and is, in, you know, shaming them for not knowing all the details of your life. But uh, we, so we are, we're all, you know, Swim Sam's Austin based, Ricky's Austin, Austin based. Uh, it's, you know, what, how's, how's life been for you during the shutdown here in Austin? Because for me, it's just, it's been Uber Eats and takeout and walks around Zilker Park. The, the trails and streets are getting uh, boring. Same old, same old every single day. Uh, you know, it started out, I feel like the first two weeks, Two, three weeks was not like a vacation, but it was like, okay, this is cool. Uh, we were ordering some take. Actually, at that point, we probably weren't even ordering takeout because everything was closed. I built a garden in the backyard for my wife. Um, oh, no, buddy, making everybody look everything. bad now. <laughs> we haven't eaten anything from it because the squirrels ate everything. And then we had to get <laughs> – that's kind of a failure right now. Um, but, you know, it's it's been good. It, it's um, – I got a little boy now. He's two and a half. My wife is working from home. I'm working from home. And so, and he loves being outside. He, I mean, the one day I had him, we put in five miles walking. He's got his little legs and he's actually like running. And so he loves being outside. So her and I, we, you know, we take our hour shifts here and there playing with them. And so it's, it's a blessing uh, to be able to see him grow up. You know, I don't think many parents can say that, you know, they literally been home for the last three or four months with their with their family like this which is awesome but also there are days where you're just like dude i could use just a few hours or a day to just give me a break man um so it's it's been a ton of fun stressful at times um but you know it i mean these times everybody's going through the same sort of thing and uh we, we do a lot of cooking at home probably get out to eat or not out to eat but Order order takeout once a week or so, and luckily they're they're also serving alcohol. Pop, pop in the in the car and take out to take out as well. <laughs> take, no, take, take out. We, we, where did we go last night? We tried to get Coleman to, to meet us up at, at uh, Tropical. What? Where did we go kind, last night? <laughs> you went to kind of tropical. Kind of, we went to kind of tropical. We went there just for the cocktails. Now I I'm I'm I don't drink very much, but uh, you know my wife, my daughter, her friends, her boyfriend. They're like they're 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 laying them back, but it's like, Hey, we can take this home. And, uh, I think that's, that's one thing that the shutdown's given us in Austin, Texas is, um, let's take it, you know, it's drive through cocktails. Yeah, I think booze. that's important. <laughs> <laughs> there's yeah, there's a good little Mexican place, you know, a little text out, take out Mexican martini and, and margarita on, to go is 
it's pretty crucial. We'll see if that keeps going when, when all this is over with. Yeah. Uh, so let's, let's, get, let's get into the swimming. Uh, and let's start from the beginning. That first moment when you broke Mel Stewart's record at Old Georgetown and, and, you, and you knew that you could be a great swimmer. Talk, talk me through that moment. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> let, let me rephrase it. Let me rephrase that. What was the moment in your career? I'm teasing. I played that drum way too much. What, what was the moment in your swimming career when you sort of had the aha? It's like, hey, wow, I could be really, I could be great at this. You know, that moment, it was, I was actually 14. Um, it was a sexual meet and I broke Michael Phelps' national record. In, and that was, so I was, four, so he had, yeah, he had already gone to the Olympics. And, and did, what, what, did he just drop out? Did he, this audio drop out when he said what it was in? Yeah. What event was it? Uh, 200 butterfly. Butterfly, um, 13, four. Oh. <laughs> well, well I, I'm right. I, I got to be honest with you. I'm so sorry. I'm writing this down. That's such an awesome piece of history. So you're 14. You break his, you broke his what? I broke his national. I broke the 14 year old national record. I, I think I, at the time, I think it was a 148.24. Um, if I remember that right. That's uh, legend. You are a legend, man. That is legend. Awesome. I think it got smashed like several years later by somebody like who went like three or four seconds faster. It might've been Michael Andrew just destroyed it. Um, but at, at that moment, um, and the caveat was Phelps actually never shaved or tapered. He was so good by then that he, that wasn't ever a big year for him, but we don't talk about that. Um, have said that. We're going to cut that out of the interview. Yeah. Cut that out. <laughs> uh, but I was, I think I got, it was at a sexuals meet. And so there are actually a bunch of Auburn guys there. And, um, I finished third behind a bunch of the college swimmers. And uh, after that race, you know, they're like, man, how old are you? And I was like, I'm, I'm 14. Like, man, we're going to, we're going to be recruiting you soon. Uh, and it was basically that moment where it was like, Oh, I'm only a freshman in high school. Yeah. Swimming, swimming can open up some doors. You know, I'm, I'm pretty good at this thing. And, uh, and it was kind of that point where it was like, yeah, I can take swimming to the next level. I can use this as a platform to um, get into a great school or take it to the next level. And, you know, at that point too, you're not really thinking about the Olympics. I think that summer, that summer, I actually, I, I got my first Olympic trial cut swimming next to Gil Stovall in the 200 fly. I got it by one one hundredth of a second. And so that was cool. But, you know, I, I hadn't really thought of the Olympics at that point, not really to probably until several years later, but that was kind of the moment where I was like, yeah, swimming, uh, swimming, I can go to the next level. And I think I was playing soccer, doing golf, basketball, a bunch of different things, and basically retired from that and started taking it a lot more seriously. So uh, we're going to stay with this narrative, and Coleman will take over the swim nerd stuff because he's so great at it. But I just have to frame this a certain way. You're, you're this cute 14-year-old kid crushing Michael Phelps records. If the future pro elite swim star Ricky Barons had come back and spoken to that 14 year old kid on deck at that time and said, Hey buddy, you're great. You just broke Michael Phelps record. That's your voice as a pro. Um, and said, this is going to happen in your future. One day you're going to be on the world platform and your suit is going to split and you're going to show your hind end to the world and become famous. Just be ready. What, how would how would your fourteen year old self have reacted if he had known that was in his coming in his future? <laughs> I'd laugh. <laughs> <laughs> Probably and when that moment happened, I was pretty pissed afterwards. But now you laugh at it. Uh, <laughs> you don't really even think about that. I'm t actually, you know what? Probably at that age, your suit probably falls off all the time. I remember that. <laughs> All right. Well played. Well played. Coleman, <laughs> uh, let's see. What is, the next, what is the next step in his swim career? Uh, so, I mean, you, you realize as a freshman, you've gotten pretty good. Um, you know, what was high school swimming like? Did you have, did you, you know, did you swim high school? Did you have a good high school swimming experience or were you more of a club kid? High school swimming in North Carolina is very much um, club swimming at Mac. And then going to your two-hour practice, dry land, and then going to the high school swim meet. Uh, it wasn't too big of a focus, but I had a – we swam high school. I had an awesome coach, Coach Alan Mollis, and uh, we, had, we had a ton of fun. 
Uh, I had a bunch of, you know, all my high school teammates, club guys, we all competed in high school. So we, we would all go do practice and then compete each other at, at, at high school meets. So we had a ton of fun. Um, we never won a state championship. Um, I, let's see, I think we were second or third my senior year. We were, we were, we had a good team. We, we had a bunch of, bunch of good guys. And I, I missed the national record in the hundred fly high school by like a 10th or two. I mean, that was like a 47 low. Um, but I went through like three different coaches, um, Morgan Bailey, Dave Gibson. Um, Dave was awesome. He, I finished basically, he was basically my high school coach, Dave Gibson, who's now down in Fort Lauderdale. And uh, he basically set me up basically for, for my college career and everything after. Was Max, was, was Swim Mac Mac back then? Yes. Yeah, yep. it was Mac. So we go swim for Mac, which is Swim Mac now. And, yep. and uh, for everybody listening, if, if you don't understand, there's, there's a few super teams in the United States. There's uh, NCAP, uh, there's uh, Nitro, and there's Swim Mac. And these are massive teams. They're, they're, they're just huge players on the, on the club stage. So who was your coach back then? Because Mac has always had some interesting coaches. Yeah, I'll, I'd probably leave them all off the, or leave a few off the list. But, you know, I start I started there when I was I got in the year around swimming. So, you know, my I started Old Georgetown where my mom was a swim coach. And, you know, I was doing summer league, um, basically I was like some maybe like junior swim league here and there in the spring. In winter, not really anything special, but at nine, I went to go swim for Mac. Uh, so I started as an age group at nine, going like three days a week or something. Um, Ray Hunt, Patty Waldron, um, Dave, and and as you can, as I got older, I basically went. I think at like age thirteen or fourteen, I went and started swimming with the senior age groups, um, and that was Morgan Bailey, who went on to coach LSU, I believe, after that. And then Dave Gibson was basically my sophomore year all the way up to my senior year. Okay. Okay. That's, I was just trying to get a sense of it. Max always had some great coaches and they're always, um, it's a, it's a great, it's a great program. Yeah. Pat. Um, yeah, there's always been a, been great coaches that have, that have come through there for sure. Yeah, no, it's, it's a, yeah, it's, um, they are a powerful force in Charlotte. Did you, yeah. and, and I wasn't, I wasn't, I had left Charlotte by the time you were really rising to prominence. And I was thinking more of you on the national stage and the global stage, <clears throat> but Charlotte is really, it seems like they're, they're seems like that they, they bang the drum for their own pretty well. Was that was, were you warmly received and, and well covered locally? Press and, and Charlotte was incredible to me. And, and I still keep in touch with, a uh, try to keep in touch with a number of those guys. I, uh, you know, every single time I went home for ultra swim, Charlotte ultra swim, it was like a hometown meet for me. And, uh, I, I love coming back and, um, you know, that, that's childhood for me. That's where I came from. I'll, I'll never forget Charlotte. Uh, I got, I've been in Austin now for basically 15 years. Uh, but every single time I go back, it's, it's, it's a, a warm welcome. I'm, <laughs> I'm getting older now, so it's so not as warm anymore. Go, go back and, and I think I went to Ultra Swim. What was that last year or two years ago? And uh, I'm kid. what? Hey, come here. Oh, we get a special. We get, <laughs> we get a guest appearance. Hey, special can you come say hi? Can you come make an appearance? He, he's asking. He, you know, he's two and a half, so he starts to get like an iPad or a Kindle now. Hey, Bo, can you come? Can you come say hi to the people? No. <laughs> no. No. No, but hey, go get mommy. We can cut this out. <laughs> uh, Ricky Barron's is being a dad right now. Uh, <laughs> he's um, he is a professional, and uh, we, we we were hoping to get a little preview on camera, but that's not going to happen. Um, but you know, here's the thing: I, selfishly, I wanted to go through um, Ricky's Charlotte years because we we share that that common ground. And next, we're going to get into the University of Texas. When, when did you make your decision to commit to the University of Texas and why? Uh, man, sorry, little man. You know, that the thing about Zoom calls and having them Zoom bomb it for a little bit, you know, it kind of makes everybody seem more human. You're doing like conversations and then you got a kid that comes and jumps in your face and you're like, all right, we're good. <laughs> 
Um, so, you know, when I was getting recruited, I was blessed. I probably wouldn't have been recruited nowadays with my times, you know, but I was, I was my national high school swimmer of the year. Um, and so I, you know, I had a lot of people, I don't, you know, reach out, but I had kind of my four or five schools that I really wanted to check out. And it was, it was Florida, Michigan, Arizona, and Texas. Those are my four schools that, um, I was really kind of focusing on, but for me, Texas was by far the front runner for the longest time. And when I was being recruited, you know, basically the American world record relay was all Texas guys for the most part. It was Aaron Pearsall, Brenda Hansen, Ian Crocker. Um, but then you also had Neil Walker, Garrett Weber, Gale. Those were, you know, those were the studs. That was the American team. If you wanted to go be a part of that national team and be a, an American swimmer, a superstar, that's where I felt like I had to go. And then uh, I had never been to Texas before my recruiting trip. And I roll in there thinking it's going to be tumbleweeds and cowboy boots. And I had no idea what to expect. And so I came on my recruiting trip and just fell in love with it. And Austin was, I wanted a college town, but not like the tiny college town. And Austin was that college town, but a city that I grew up in, you know, it was Austin and Charlotte are very similar. And so coming to Austin, it had everything I wanted. And I mean, Eddie and Chris, those two, uh, you know, I still talk to them uh, probably at least once a week, just catching up, exchanging texts. And those guys were like dads to me. And uh, those were kind of the father figures that my parents also felt, you know, if you were going to hand your kid off to somebody in, in college uh, to be a coach, those, those are two guys that they really respected. We get phone calls all the time from parents asking about club, you know, which college should my kids swim for? And it's always based on success of the coach and like how the team's doing. But the, you know, the, the, the truth is the subtext of it is that coach is going to be a, a, a sub parent, a second tier parent to your kid and your development of your child. And that matters if you care about integrity and um, yeah, those, 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 they're, they're Eddie and Chris, they're good people. They're sweethearts. They're they're And they have the loyalty of their swimmers. A lot of swimmers go through that, you know, a lot of coaches will have a lot of swimmers come through their program. They don't have the loyalty of their swimmers later on. But uh, no. it seems like it seems like yeah, 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 it, yeah. Uh, you, you know, your freshman year, you get in there, and you're a freshman. You got no idea what to expect. You're excited to be there. Excited to be in college. You're kind of free to some extent. And basically, the first week, you know, all the upperclassmen uh, sit you down, and you have your team meeting of of everything that's expected out of you. And one of the things you always remember is you say thank you to Eddie and Chris after every single practice. They're here, you know, coaching you to make you a better swimmer. They're here because they love being here and they want to make you better. And, you know, they don't have to be here, but <laughs> it's their job. But you tell them thank you and be respectful to them after every single practice. And I remember my freshman year, you know, our college, it is very rare to come through the Texas program and not win a national championship. You know, four years that go by, it's very rare. And so freshman year, we're going to win a national championship. We're going to win a national championship. And we got fifth, sixth. It was, I think Eddie has only finished outside of the top four, maybe five times in his career in Texas. It's 1979, yeah. Yeah. Um, and seeing the look on Eddie's face, it, it not only hurt us, but like he was just beat up. I don't know if it was because of that finish, but also I think he may have felt bad for us because, you know, he knows how much we care and swim, but as a group, as a team, you just felt like you let our coaches down, like our performance, you know, you, we, we have so much loyalty to them that every single time we practice, we wanted to make them proud. We wanted to, you know, achieve everything that they wanted in us. And so that was one of the hardest parts of freshman year was seeing that look on Eddie's face, just being like, man, we really, really let him down. Was that was that uh, 2007? Yeah, 2006, 2007. Okay. Yep. Um, so, so what what changed from there? I mean, what? How did you guys improve? Did, did, do you think that was just a bad meet for you all, or did you have some you know some some stuff that you really had to work out? For me, for the team, um, you know, you sometimes your freshman year, you just 
I think it's almost just like a shock to your system. Like high school, I was winning everything or not winning everything, but you know, I was on top of the, I was top of the podium for the most part, you know, North Carolina sectionals or nationals. I was one of those top age groupers. You get to college. You're like, you're just, you're a, you're another fish in the pond. Yeah. And it was kind of like a switch. Like, do I deserve to be here? What does it take to, you know, I, I expected to go into NCAAs and I remember reading stuff. Yeah. I'm picking Ricky Barron's to win the 200 butterfly. I'm like, yeah, I'm going, I'm going to win this. And I didn't even make it back top 16. I just straight choked. And it was like, you just kind of expect, and it's like, you can't just go in there and do everything you've been doing. You can't, they're not going to, no, no, no. These are like the best swimmers in the world from all over the world. And you better go in there and it's a fight. And so it was basically a shock to the system of like, oh, this is what it's all about. This is what it's going to take. And so that next year, uh, my sophomore year, I had a great, much better sophomore year where I think I was like second or third in 200 IM. I think I finaled in all three of my events and got basically on board because, I mean, it was, it was a punch in the face. It was a slap in the face. Just like, oh, okay, this is what it's like. How much of that was just the training, just, you know, going from high school to college? And it seems like I think everybody experiences it, but it feels like your, your body just gets hammered because you have to acclimate to so much more work in the pool and the weight room. Yeah, it's – we always – you know, throw out the idea that you just, to some extent, every single freshman should redshirt because there is such a big change just from the training. Like it, it could take about two years for you to really adjust. And I think that goes with any sort of coaching change. It could take about two years unless it's pretty similar. And, you know, we didn't, I would like to think that Dave, uh, my high school coaching and Eddie are somewhat similar, um, but also the weight lifting. That was probably the biggest thing. That's what really knocks you out doing the weights combined with the, with the yardage. Yeah. Your body changed freshman to sophomore year. It's like you, you go from looking like a little kid to looking like a man. Yep. But, uh, so is, is there a, as we don't have it all the time in the world, but let's, let's, let's try to bring college to a few moments. Is there, is there one moment in, in your collegiate career with, with Eddie in the university of Texas that was, that was just burned into your brain. It's like, this is what really crystallizes the, the experience of being, <laughs> Longhorn. Uh, there's this, a number of them. Uh, and it's like one picture where there's so many things going on too, but that's I, okay. We, what? That's okay. We're right here. Hey, we, we don't have all day. No, I think that probably the, the biggest thing, I, I mean, is winning a national championship at Texas our senior year. And I, I think it's more the path that it took. It was, Going in our freshman year, hey, we're going to win a national championship, getting fifth. Okay, sophomore year, we're going to win a national championship. We're going to win a national championship, getting second. Junior year, we're going to win a national championship. We're going to win a national championship, second again. And so in that senior year, it's like, what does it take? What are we going to do? Like, we can't leave here and not win a national championship. Because, I mean, we had a stacked team. I and mean, we had good teams the entire, you know, four years. And then two days before that meet starts, NCAAs, Jimmy, Jimmy Feagan gets sick. We're like, oh, he ate a rare steak. He's got a stomach bug. The next day, I get sick. Bill Taylor gets sick. Eric Friedland gets sick. Drew Livingston, our best diver, gets sick. Eddie gets sick. And we came down with the, uh, not coronavirus. Uh, norovirus. 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 Yeah, where they actually ended up delaying the meat for an entire day. And, I mean, we, were, we went through that whole meat. It was just like, God, how did this just happen? Like, we can't let – we can't let this happen to us um, and talk about overcoming challenges. I mean, we were getting IVs in between uh, were they in, be in between sessions or like leading up to it because I mean, we were so dehydrated. We were throwing up. We were, I mean, we were sick as dogs going through that meat. Um, and the last day, I think we were behind, but we just had to have a, excuse my language, a hell of a session. And we blew out our, it was Sunday morning instead of Saturday. And we basically didn't have to screw up Sunday night. Um, and we were going to win. We had a good, good amount of uh, final swims to, to beat Cal. And uh, we ended up winning. And, I mean, <laughs> we were winning by 38 points going into the last relay or something like that. So we just had to uh, finish the relay. And we were going to win. We wanted more than 40. 
and then we could DQ the relay and still be fine. And it was like 38, and uh, somebody flinched. I remember somebody flinched on the blocks. It was, uh, I think it was Auburn, and David Walters was leading off, and he thought he flinched, and he thought he just lost us the national championship. Uh, but uh, we finished that relay, and it was just like four years all at once finally coming together for that moment. And people ask me, what's better, winning a individual gold medal or national championship or doing it with a team and a relay? And it's the team because, I mean, you had a group of 20 guys and really 40, 50 guys that worked so hard for that one moment and to celebrate and to be a part of that with all this, these really like brothers to you. Uh, that's really what encapsulates everything. I'm in Hagen. I'm Coleman. You got anything? So you, uh, you know, you talked about it's way better to win with a team, and and that kind of transitions us to your international career, where where you won, you know, ten plus medals on on pretty much every major stage uh, in relays. Do you have, you know, do you have a favorite international relay that you were, got to be a part of? Do you have a favorite international meet that you went to? Yeah, I was a relay swimmer. Uh, you know, I, I just had, I had, God, I just always got up for relays. I was always so pumped to be on relays and, and I could always swim. You know, I, I love swimming the individual, but there was just something being on some of those relays that I don't know if the pressure wasn't on as much because you always had Phelps on there and lock. <laughs> we were always like studs on it. Uh, but I always swim my fastest. I was always so pumped up and never wanted to let those guys down. Um, one of my favorite relays, I mean, I always swim in the Olympics was is awesome. I mean, 2008, I mean, every single relay has a story. The moment, um, my first international competition was a national, uh, junior nationals, uh, right, junior national team in Australia, being a part of those guys. Um, but then 2008, swimming the prelims of the four by 200, because who didn't swim Basically, there was one spot open for the finals. And it was me, Peter Vander Kay, and we knew he was going to go in the finals. Cleet Keller, or Fenn. Or, no, no, Peter was already on it. It was me, Dave, Eric, and Cleet. Yep. And I had beat Cleet, outsplit Cleet by a tenth of a second. And it was like, hey, this is awesome. Like, hey, that was quite the experience. And I get to the warm down pool and I outsplit him. And I was like, yeah, Cleet's going to go. He's, the guy from 2004 that, you know, he was the hero in 2004. No way he's going on that. And the coaches came up and told me, hey, so uh, you better go and get in the warm down pool and uh, get ready for tomorrow. And I, I start tearing up still thinking about it. And I look up and my parents, the, the way the warm down pool is, there's a big like skywalk and where uh, the fans could look down in the warm up pool. And I look up there, and my whole family's up there, except for my brother. He was scared to fly. <laughs> and they're up there like, hey, what's going on? Are you good? And I'm like in the warm down pool, like giving them like the thumbs up. And you just see them jumping up and down and giving each other hugs. And because I was swimming the, pre the finals relay the next day. Um, in that moment, I mean, I was, I swam like a second slower um, than I did in prelims, but it, it didn't matter. We won by like five seconds. And uh, I mean, what? For that to be the first ever gold medal, I mean, to have that experience, I mean, just unbelievable. Uh, you, you were dominant on relays, and it's uh, and I forgot about this, but uh, 2009 World Championships was a, was a pretty sweet moment. It was uh, that pool was beautiful, Rome was was fun, but um, I forgot that you split a 144-1 fastest split at at the fastest swimming meet in history. I mean, there was a world record every single race. It was the rubberized polyurethane super suit. Yep. Uh, so it's, it's in terms of just feeling and experience in terms of the international stage when everything comes together, and that's your fast, that, that was the fastest split. Is there a moment that really epitomizes that for you? That, that meet, you talk, that was going to be the other meet I, I talked about because that, that was probably like my most fun meet. Like, I mean, yeah, we had those super suits, which made everybody feel good. But God, I felt, I felt just good. I mean, I was just on pace. I was hitting everything. And that was one of my big disappointments in the four by one when I split my suit was that 
I was, I mean, I was hot. Like I was, I could have, I wanted to be on that finals relay so bad. Like I knew I could throw something down. And so for me to split my suit, I think I still split a 48 one. Yeah. I think I still split a 48 one with a parachute in my suit. <laughs> Um, so I knew I, I could have thrown something down pretty fast. Um, so I was disappointed in that. But then I, I, I led off the morning relay with a 144 nine. And then, um, the finals relay, honestly, I split a 44 one. And I remember hitting that wall, just being like, God, I could have gone so much faster. Like I, that was probably the best I'd ever felt in my entire career. So I, I was excited with that performance, but God, I, I know there are some other times I could have thrown down in that meet. It's a, uh, I, just, I remember seeing your parents between prelims and finals and uh, it's, it's with the, with, with the suit split and they were loving the global attention. They're like, did you see this? Did you see that? I'm like, yeah, I'm seeing it all. We're seeing it all. And it's like, it must be weird to like, it's like one day you're, you know, it's like swimmers have a level of fame and it's like you do when you, when you're swimming at your level and you, you know, you, you're an Olympic champion, but it's like, suddenly you become the story of the news cycle for about 72 hours all over the world. And that's kind of crazy. We're, we're down to under a minute. So I just want to know, are you traumatized from that moment? <laughs> yeah, it's hard to have a conver- conversation and it not come up. And now like in the, in the business world too, and you're, you're connecting, you're tr- setting up meetings and, and meeting with people and they're like, oh, I, I Googled you. I don't, and I'm like, God, what is popping up in Google nowadays? Like, has that gone down the page any? <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. It's uh, okay. We, we, we got a whole lot to cover with you. And, and will you come back and we can talk about your international career? And uh, we'll, we'll, we'll do some research on, on Georgetown just to support all the facts that I stated as fact and history in the beginning. Everybody believes the news and, and facts nowadays, too. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you, Ricky Barons, Olympic champion, the greatest old Georgetown swimmer of all time. Thanks for having me. You've been listening to the Swim Swam podcast. Stay tuned for new episodes every week. You can take Swim Swam podcasts on the go by subscribing on your favorite podcast platform. Look for links in the description below and be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel for more videos as well.